Okay, well, I think we should probably get going. Um, it's 11.35, and I know there's some other community members who may hop on, um, and there were some who expressed interest when we emailed about this but could not attend today. So we're recording this, um, and we'll share it with them. Um, I think there's a lot of interest in uh, continuing the work in La Rosa Park, so uh, we'll have this available recording to share with people after the fact as we start talking more about this exciting opportunity. Jeff. Join the meeting. Oh, sweet. All right. Um, so thanks so much for coming, everyone. <clears throat> this is our Ask a Planner series. It is oh, awesome. So on the phone, I think this might be Nikki. We will see. Um, so this is our Ask a Planner series. It happens most most of the last Fridays of the month, and it's an opportunity to have a community conversation. Um, usually it's about a sort of generally about a different planning topic in Denver. So it could be about our um, water supply or about historic districts or about uh, the plans for growth in the city. Uh, but today it's really specifically about a really fun, exciting opportunity we have based on some recent historic uh, research, really great projects at the city to continue working on um, off the momentum of the name change La Raza Park uh, that Councilman Sandoval sponsored um, and contemplate actually landmarking, so making a historic landmark out of uh, the park or components of Join the park, the Osco, uh, things like that. So we uh, just wanted to start this uh, community conversation um, as a bit of a kickoff. And uh, actually Councilman Sandoval and myself and Kara um, and Parks Department staff actually had a meeting yesterday to really kick off uh, the conversation. And so we're excited to be kind of reaching out publicly about this and just answer questions and talk about the project a little bit. So I am live streaming on Facebook um, and I'm also monitoring Facebook if there are questions that come in there. I know some people are watching there. Um, and we'll make sure that we answer those questions and get them up later um, when we start just having the conversation. Um, otherwise, for those who are on the meeting, feel free to uh, put questions in the chat uh, and we can get to those later. Uh, we'll just talk a little bit about, we'll start the meeting by talking um, a little bit about the process that sort of um, gotten the research and the momentum behind, um, not just the conversation about landmarking La Rosa Park, but about other really important cultural um, assets uh, all around Denver. Um, so I'm gonna initially kind of turn it over to uh, Rowena Alegria, who is our chief storyteller here at the city um, and has been involved in this project. Um, and then you know, I think we might also have uh, Nikki Gonzalez on the phone. I think she's popped on and off a little bit, but it might be the phone number there. Um, we'll give her a chance to talk about her involvement. Um, and then I'll jump back in again and start talking about what we can do about all this amazing research and we'll uh, switch it over to uh, talking a little bit with Kara about uh, landmarking and what that it would actually mean. And then we'll just open it up to Q&A, talk about what that would mean and, and how we can really move this forward. Uh, all right, so thanks so much, uh, Rowena. I'm gonna pass it over to you. You could unmute um, and talk a little bit about the um, amazing work that uh, you've been doing with the city and with the Mexican-American, Chicano, Latino historic context. Absolutely. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you to the councilwoman um, for not only having me here, but for supporting the work. Um, I, I don't know how much folks know about the historic context or, or what historic context is. Um, it seems like, you know, a fairly savvy group, so I won't go on long, but Essentially, we the, the Denver Office of Storytelling, which is a community storytelling project that is trying literally to change the history of Denver by telling this, well, we don't tell the stories, allowing the community, providing a platform to community to fill in the gaps in our history. And in this case, um, the history that was missing from landmark preservation planning uh, is the the first time we partnered with community planning and development, they were doing the city's first Chicano Latino historic context. And it's the first time ethnicity and culture have been taken into account. And my office created a companion film uh, to share and it's called Que Viva La Raza, uh, honoring a Denver legacy. 
And um, I was going to try to show a little bit of the film, but I don't know that I have, uh, I don't see an opportunity to share, but if, if someone, yeah, if you could do it, um, I am definitely dot org is where you'll find it because I know you're going to want to watch the whole thing but if we could maybe just show uh, a snippet of the for the very beginning maybe nine seconds or something to give people a sense of the kind of work that we were doing which was to try to bring this history to life and I'm sure Nikki can talk about um, how much work went into it, it they were supposed to do a hundred pages history of Chicanos, Latinos, Mexicanos in Denver. And they wound up doing like 200 pages of history and scratching the surface because we have a very rich history here. So anyway, did, did you find it? And I'll stop talking. And then um, you guys can see just a little bit of the work. And like I said, if you want to see the rest of it, I am Denver.org. Awesome. Yes, I'm able to bring it up and I am going to start sharing my screen. Bring this over. Oops. Everybody see that? Or is it just my background? <laughs> we can see it. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So I'm just gonna let's see. Let's just play the first uh, little intro. If you hit the little corner square in the bottom right, it'll go full. Perfect. In the past 20 or 30 years, Denver has been transformed, and the rate of demolition is alarming when you think about the, the historic buildings that have been raised in the age of development. And with those buildings and with the shifts of population that have occurred because of gentrification, we're losing entire neighborhoods that have been critical to not only the history of, of Denver itself. But the the Chicano Latino community, beautiful buildings that they turned down to build these um, boxes. Because I don't know if I want to call them boxes, you know. And I know a wonderful people live there, but our essence, our Luantino, the Las Casas from that, you know, that beautiful home. Like the way the north side looks, and Rhino, and Five Points. It's so boring. It's, there's just no, no life there. I mean, it's just stale. I just leave it down from there. Well, you're right. Campus eliminated a very large Latino population. Most people in Denver they have no knowledge of that. You go on that campus, and there's the old San Cayetano Church, what we call San Cabbage's Church. Um, so there was a deep Latino culture there. For a population like the Latino community, whose stories were not always told in traditional narratives and books and articles and so forth, when you lose that physical landscape, you don't talk to people about those places, you lose that history. So this historic context project is part of a larger series of projects undertaken by the city of Denver to create an understanding of the actual history of the city itself. So looking at in, in detail those communities that have been historically marginalized and the stories and these physical buildings um, of importance have been demolished. The information that comes out of this context report will be used to inform preservation efforts. And for a community like the Latino community, these stories have not often been reported more traditional narrative ways, this is the same thing. So we have to understand our history and what has happened. And once we understand that, then we can understand how we can make a picture. And you can't start with a clean slate. You've got to go back and get the history. That's probably a good place to stop right there. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I said, you can go watch the whole entire thing on imdenver.org. Um, so proud of this work. And I will tell you that the Denver Public Library, the Western History Collection, we couldn't have done it without them. Um, uh, so many of the images come from them, but also from community members who helped us provide images and helped us visualize this story 
even in places where our history was missing from the official narrative, we, we were able to fill it in from that. So um, I, I'm gonna go ahead and stop and if folks have questions or whatnot, um, I, I, it looks like I might be frozen a little, so I'm gonna stop my video and um, yeah. Awesome. Um, there's no quite specific questions at this time, but maybe, um, let's see, I think, I don't see Nikki anymore on the phone, but um, Kara, maybe you wanna just talk a little bit about how, for example, Marina's work interacts and how this project sort of interacts with the actual, um, you know, what what is intended to come out of this and, and kind of how your department works um, and how this interacts with it, basically. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Kara Hahn. I'm a principal planner with Landmark Preservation. Um, and as Rose started talking, um, this is, uh, we're, we're doing a historic context series uh, to look at the history of historically excluded communities um, within the city and county of Denver. And um, this is our first uh, historic context. And historic context is just like a fancy way of saying a history, um, sort of like a history paper, but a really long one, 200 pages, um, on um, different communities within Denver. And coming out of it, um, in addition to the I Am Denver um, documentary, uh, we wanted to look at what are things that we could do from information that has come forward through the historic context. And one of the things, you know, what's an action item? What's something that we can do that can be implemented from this? And one of those, um, with the leadership of Councilwoman Sandoval and the Parks Department, is to designate La Raza Park as um, a historic cultural district. And so we, as um, was just mentioned, we just had a meeting about it yesterday, about sort of um, kicking it off and how do we as, you know, multiple different governmental departments, parks and landmark and a city council office work to get this designated um, to really honor um, the, the Latino community and the Chicano community that has used La Raza and in particular the kiosco and the murals that are in there and how important the murals are to the Chicano movement in Denver. And so we are just starting the process of gathering the information when the park was renamed. I know um, this councilwoman's office did a ton of work on that and a lot of research. And so um, thank you for sending that over. I saw I got an email this morning about it. Um, so we're gonna take a look at that and see what we can do to combine what's been done in the historic context and what's been done for the renaming of the park and how much history we already know about it and how we can get this um, designated as a historic cultural district. Awesome. And maybe actually I have a question on, on uh, Facebook about what is a cultural historic district? And maybe you could talk a little bit about how Lynn Marks is, is working and thinking about the importance of history and the you know the traditional kind of when we think about a landmark about a beautiful beautiful building um but that uh is you know kind of preserved but maybe just tends to tell sort of one narrative of of the history of a place and, and how that is expanding um including with this work right right sure so uh about 2019 we updated the landmark designation criteria of what you know what is it there, there's a set of criteria of what it means to be a Denver landmark. And we updated that and included um, cultural criteria because uh, the history of Denver as told through our landmarks only tells one narrow story of Denver. And so we added the cultural criteria in order to expand um, and be more inclusive of what properties are designated. And so we have one historic cultural district that was recently done, La Alma Lincoln Park. And then our original historic cultural district, which is five points. Um, and so we are looking at La Raza as a way, La Raza Park as a way to add another historic cultural district that can tell a different part of Denver's story. And so um, it's still a historic district. It's still a Denver landmark. It's just a historic cultural landmark, historic cultural district. It's a little more inclusive, but it doesn't really change the nature of what a landmark is. And one of the things when we've done, uh, La Alma Lincoln Park was recently designated and we work closely with parks to make sure that the park can continue to be a park, that it's an important part, that it's ongoing legacy and it's continued use is important. And so while the Kiosco and um, 
the murals will be preserved. It will still, you can still have maintenance. You can still, you know, update the basketball court or put in a new playground or something like that because the continued ongoing use is an important component of its preservation. Um, it's not just putting in, you know, in an amber and time and it can never be changed. It's, you know, wanting when we work with parks is that it allows it to be used by the community while also still preserving the important components that really reflect the history and culture of La Raza Park. Awesome, thanks so much. Yeah, and I think that got to another question that I saw, which was, um, would this mean that, you know, what, what would this mean maybe for um, the current users of the park or any of the, you know, traditional cultural events that happen on there? Does it mean there's gonna be another level of bureaucracy that the everyday user has to deal with in terms of using the park? Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, no, not really. Like we, um, we in Landmark don't regulate use. So there's not like a special, you don't need to come to Landmark for a special permit to hold a festival or a celebration there. Um, it just means that if someone wanted to demolish the kiosco or um, the artwork by Emmanuel Martinez, um, those would be uh, preserved and not be allowed to be demolished, not allowed to be removed. So we would be preserving those important character defining features of the park, but for the average person, you know, they're gonna, there's gonna be a little plaque that says this is a Denver landmark and you'll see that and you'll understand that it's been recognized for that. But for the average user who just wants to come and have a picnic there, um, who just wants to come and play basketball there, that's, you know, that ongoing use will continue. Does that answer awesome. the question? Good. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Um, we got, oh, we got a question from Gabe. This is a great question. Um, are there any recent books um, to check out from the library or to purchase that talks about um, this kind of topic uh, that you could recommend. Maybe that's also a question for Ro. I'd recommend the uh, the historic context report. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing um, and it's quite long. Um, and that is, I think, available online. I think yeah, it is. Download it's, it. Right? It is available on our website. Um, one of the things that um, I really like about the report is there's a nice like seven or eight page executive summary that's a really nice kind of summary. And then if there's a particular topic you want to look at, if you want to look at politics or you want to look at community life, you can just go to that section and, and you can learn quite a bit about that without having to read the whole document. So if there's a particular thing that you want to know about the parks, um, I believe the parks are in community life, you can go and just read about that. Or if you just want to learn about the politics of the Chicano movement, you can just go and read that section. So I don't want like the 200 pages to seem too daunting. It's a really thorough um, report. It goes over a lot of it, um, you know, tries to, to cover a, a wide range of topics, but that you don't have to be um, limited to just one thing or you can read the whole thing. And Roe might be able to add what are some um, other resources that would be available. Yeah, I, I, as far as the report goes, there's also at the end a list of the sources that includes lots of books uh, that were consulted to, to create this historic document. So there's the, that I would recommend looking at that list uh, because there's lots and lots of resources there that, that can lead you to lots of fun books and really interesting things to look at. And of course, I'm going to plug our work um, because while we, we, participated in this amazing project. We've also done um, 400 documentary, well, not documentaries, I wish, 400 films um, in the three years that, that the Denver Office of Storytelling has existed. And we've done uh, a, a, an hour long documentary called Chicanas, uh, Nurturers and Warriors. That one's available there to watch. We did one about the uh, Japanese American community in the Machi camp that was in Southeast Colorado. We did one about uh, how wheelchair activists in Denver helped to push the ADA forward by literally climbing out of their wheelchairs at Colfax and Broadway and blocking RTD buses for two days. Um, there's lots of really, if you're interested in, in Denver history and especially hearing from marginalized communities, there's some really fun stuff there on imdenver.org to, to watch um, in addition to doing some of that historic reading. I muted myself. Um, that's so awesome. Thank you. I know I'm definitely going to go explore that because it's just incredible stories. And like, I always feel so 
so honored when I talk to some of my neighbors who've lived in my neighborhood for 40 years. And I'm like, tell me everything, like, tell me all your stories. And there's just so much richness and so much history everywhere. And it's incredible to have a space where that's being all collected. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so let's see, I have another question. And actually this one comes from a, uh, a gentleman that I was speaking with last night. We, so right now, this all kind of take us back a step and ground us in uh, the kind of the neighborhood where this is taking place. So the Denver statistical neighborhood, um, and I know like a lot of people like Amanda, Councilman Sandoval, like this is the North side. Like there's, you know, people call all sorts of different things, but the Denver statistical neighborhood that La Raza Park is located in is Sunnyside. Although it is right on the border with the statistical neighborhood of Highland, um, but Actually, there's this really interesting process going on right now called the Neighborhood Planning Initiative that is um, the neighborhoods of Jefferson Park, Highland, Sunnyside, and Chaffee Park are all going through this two-year process where um, the planning department, so not necessarily Kara's department, she focuses on landmarks, but it's still the same, it's kind of the big umbrella um, department um, is doing a planning exercise, is doing a lot of community outreach, um, to create a planning document for these four neighborhoods that will guide all sorts of city investments and policies for the next 20 years. And so we've just been doing a bunch of community outreach. We just had one with Sunnyside yesterday, um, and I attended the meeting that was um, all held in Spanish, which is really wonderful. And we had this great family come um, and listen in. And we got to mention a little bit uh, some of this project that's going on. And they started talking a little bit about how, like we kind of asked them like, well, what do you think of La Raza Park? And like, they're like, we love the activities there, but we don't really like to go there. We think it's a bit um, run down or something like that, you know, that was just their experience. Um, but I was maybe thinking, um, Kara, you could talk about something we were talking about yesterday, which is that, or actually Stacy from the Parks Department was talking about it, that if there, if this park is landmarked, it can open up some more funding opportunities um, to help with things like upkeep, um, especially to the the main, you know, structures, the main components that make it historic. But also um, other things like that. If you have any uh, thoughts you could add on just kind of when something is landmarked, what kind of opportunities are there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when a property is a Denver landmark they become eligible for a couple of different funding sources. And it depends a little bit on what it is as to who can best take advantage of it. Um, there are uh, state um, historic preservation tax credits, which are credits for um, against your state taxes, which doesn't really um, apply to the city as a city owned property. Mm. But there's also the state historical fund. So Colorado is really quite lucky. It has one of the larger um, historic preservation um, granting agencies in the country, True History Colorado, and nonprofits are eligible to apply for state historical fund grants for the preservation um, and retention of historic properties. And so something if it is, so if this were designated, um, it would be eligible for um, SHF, state historical fund grants, for the preservation of the murals, for you know, the upkeep of, you know, if there's a large maintenance that's required for the kiosco, um, it would be eligible for those grants in order to help with the preservation of, of the kiosco and the historic components of the park. Awesome, thanks. Um, oh, another question. Um, would this kind of related to that, but would there be like say the, the park is designated is there anything that the park has to do, like fix, like repair part of the kiosco or um, other things? Like, is there construction or stuff that would happen as a result of the of landmarking that would like impact the park or impact use of the park in the short term? No, there's no requirements to restore or improve the property. So anything that's landmarked, you don't have to make changes, whether it's your own personal house or whether it's the parks. You don't have to change anything if you don't want to. Um, if you do change something that requires a building or zoning permit, we're going to review it, um, Landmark is, to make sure that it um, retains its historic character and is compatible with the neighborhood if there are changes that are proposed. But there's nothing that requires you to restore it to some sort of pristine um, appearance. It can still, you know, function and use as a park, still be maintained, but not something that we're going to require you to restore it to what it looked like when the kiosco was originally built. 
unless parks wants to go forward and you know they're gonna have a capital project to do it then we would review it but they don't have to do anything okay sounds good and would there be any um any impact to the homes surrounding the park or anything like that no, it's only the area that is actually within the designation. So the parks would get that the homes around it would, you know, get the benefit that this is going to remain. This is still going to remain a park. It's still going to remain a kiosk. Um, the murals are still going to be there. So they'll get to enjoy that, but they themselves will not have any, um, it will have no impact upon the community members around it. Perfect. Um, and if somebody, oh, this is interesting, if somebody has, um, has a story, maybe with some of the surrounding properties has like ex like stories or um, extra information about like either the park or their family's attachment to like houses surrounding it or, or things like that. Is there anyone they can reach out to um, to tell their story? Um, you can reach out to me. I would, we would love to hear that. We, like I said, we just started the process of um, the designation and we want to do, you know, it's going to include some community outreach and wanting to tell the stories um, I think Ro um, mentioned earlier about getting the, you know, photos and images from, you know, people in the community. And we like to say that, you know, Denver's history lives in the attics and basements of people's homes where they have their photos and their photo albums. So we would love to hear the stories and, um, you know, have community input into, you know, events that were held there, or how, why it's important to you or, you know, what you witnessed in the park. Um, so we would love to have that. You can reach out to me. Um, I am going to be the project manager for this for the landmark side, so um, I can put my email in the chat and anyone can, you know, reach out to me that way. That is awesome. And I'm also going to put that in Facebook because we have a bunch of people watching there asking questions. Um, so I will make sure that that goes in there as well. All right, let's see. Uh, how long will this process take? <laughs> Um, that is a very good question. Um, so I'll, I'll take that a little bit um, based on our, our chat again yesterday. The great news um, is that the Parks Department is, is fully on board with pursuing this. There's just some kind of details to get worked out. Um, for example, what portion of the park would be incorporated into this? Um, or as Kara said, if, if it's a historic district, quote unquote, um, then you can also pinpoint that there are certain features of the park that are more, I don't know, the, the really significant parts of it. So, you know, it's not necessarily the random lawn part that needs to be protected. Um, it's the kiosco, it's the plaza, because um, that's where a lot of the danza takes place and the markets and things like that. So the layout um, and the key features of it that would be protected. Um, the first step is really to, uh, again, get the boundaries, I would say, um, so you know kind of what we're working with. Um, and then it's very likely that myself um, in Councilman Sandoval's office um, might be working, you know, with Kara and with any other community volunteers who want uh, to actually put together the application. Um, but we have a lot of information um, that I gathered when I created the report when Councilman Sandoval was doing the name change. Um, so we were really lucky to work with uh, librarians at the Blair Caldwell Library, um, historians that uh, you can put in research requests for, and they have an incredible amount of information. They go back through archives, through news clippings, things like that. Um, and so when we were putting together the case for the name change, we did a lot of research into the history of the park and the importance to the community. Uh, so luckily, there actually may be a pretty good foundation because writing the application for the landmarking is usually the biggest and heaviest lift. Um, and there's some requirements for that. So we're just kicking that off. Um, it, it depends on how long writing that may take, but then uh, maybe Carrie, you could add, um, once we do actually get the application written and in, kind of what does the process look like there? Are there public hearings? Like how long does it take? Things like that. Yeah, sure. So. Um... As we are, you know, working on writing the designation application, we will be doing, you know, outreach to the community so people know that this is occurring. Um, and then, um, if once it's formally submitted, it will go to the Landmark Preservation Commission for their review. And it is the commission is made up of nine volunteer members of the community who are appointed by the mayor, um, and they are experts in historic preservation and the history of Denver in construction 
architects, architectural historians, um, a, a resident of a historic district or um, in a Denver landmark. Um, and they review it to determine if the application meets the landmark criteria. And then if they believe and find that it has met the criteria, it's then forwarded to Denver City Council for their review. And there are a couple of different um, hearings before Denver City Council. And at both the Landmark Preservation Commission and at the final hearing before City Council, it is a public hearing where the community um, has the opportunity to provide their comments on um, the designation application. And that normally takes about oh, two to four months and that, that entire process. And really it's just, you know, there's some noticing requirements and then getting it on City Council's calendar and schedule. So it's normally a couple month process to kind of go through the entire process of getting something designated. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, yeah, and I'm sure we'll put together, you know, there, there's requirements for outreach. So I know the way Councilman Sandoval works with all the various projects we've done is we love to partner with the city and then also do a lot on our own from our office for outreach. Um, I'll be talking to the councilman about, you know, maybe there's some fun event um, that we can do at the park to raise awareness about this. And then of course, you know, if it does get the landmark approval, a big celebration, because uh, that's also really important. Um, but also piggybacking off of maybe other events that are happening just to, again, raise awareness about this, what it would mean, um, and to, to celebrate that this is, you know, this is actually work coming out of the, um, the historic report and all the work that um, Rose's office has done and, and we're acting on it um, and protecting a really important uh, community asset. So I'm sure we'll do, um, let's see, we have a question about kind of maybe more specifics about outreach. Um, we will do, I'm sure, mailers. Uh, I know we like to do door-to-door -door kind of door hangers to let people know about things. Mm -hmm. um, and word of mouth is really important. So everyone that's listening to this right now or either the recording, um, please tell tell your friends and tell your neighbors and everyone who has a, a connection to this park. So we know that it's not just people who um, still currently live here. There's a lot of, as you know, the, the video we saw in the beginning explained and as we all probably know, there's been a lot of displacement, um, but also a lot of people who have really strong ties to this place who may not live, you know, in Sunnyside or Highland or the North Side or even Denver anymore. But um, we know this is important to you. So we want to make sure that um, we hear, you know, hear your input um, and that you can be involved uh, if this is meaningful for you and you want to be as well. Um, so a question, actually, this is sorry, maybe a more like logistical question for me, for you, Kara, um, and also for parks. Are we allowed to put signs in the park? <laughs> It's kind of because it's a public property. I know parks has a lot of rules about like whether or not you can have signage in parks. Usually it's just about, you know, if there's an event coming up, you have like two weeks to put something in there. Do you have any idea? Yeah, I am. I, I apologize. I don't know what parks rules are in terms of signage that's like temporary signage. Mm -hmm. If it's a landmark and it's a temporary sign, we don't review temporary signs. So um, once it becomes a landmark and you want to put up a temporary sign to, um, you know, announce an event. Um, it's not something that we would review, but I'm sure Parks has some regulations. But I don't. I don't want to speak on their behalf. Absolutely. Um, so another way that uh, communicate community can learn um, about the process as as we go and get updates. Please sign up for Councilman Sandoval's email monthly newsletter. Um, it's a great way to learn about what's going on uh, in the district one and policies and other things and in the city that we want to highlight for our residents. Um, and that link, let's see, I'll put make sure that that link goes into our Zoom chat here and also on Facebook. Um, we'll definitely be including updates about this process there. And I will also include my uh, personal email. You can always email me. Um, you can also talk to me on the phone. Um, so let's see if we have any more questions coming in. And if we don't, um, I was actually thinking we could end this. Oh, let's see. Okay, I think we're good. Um, so I was thinking that might be fun to tie up this conversation today by, um, uh, I could show a little bit of the presentation that uh, Kara referenced that I did give when we were renaming Gladassa Park, because um, there's some great historic pictures in here. Um, it shouldn't take too long, maybe 10 minutes, but uh, I know there's some really fun info in here. And again, this would be uh, probably incorporated a lot into the eventual 
uh, application that we would do for landmarking. Um, so if that sounds good, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, show this to you all. And apologies, it's been a while since I gave the presentation. So hopefully I remember um, everything, but mostly the pictures are pretty great. So let me share my screen. All right. Uh, so again, I put this together um, with the help of some amazing historians and community members who shared a lot of information about the park. Um, and we gave this to both the parks um, advisory board and then city council to approve the name change um, last year. So uh, the presentation talked a lot uh, really chronologically about the origins of the park in the early 1900s, why it was even named Columbus, the fact that it wasn't named Columbus in the beginning. Um, and if you don't know, this, <laughs> I, should, I should take a step back. This park, although it's been known as La Raza Park to, for probably, I mean, for 50 plus years to most people, actually was officially named Columbus Park until the so last year that we got the official name change. So, um, but it, it wasn't even named Columbus Park from the very beginning. Um, it actually came in in the 30s, which I'll talk about. Uh, so talking about the origins of the park, the naming, what, what the area was like kind of at the, this early phase through the 30s. And then as the population of the neighborhood started changing and the Chicano rights movement started happening in the 1960s, 1970s and beyond, how use of the park changed again, um, and then how we all got to the, the application that came in to do the official name change last year. So this park was built um, or kind of, we say platted out in planner speak. It was, it was space for it was set out um, in the development of this part of Denver, which is one of the very earliest suburbs. Um, so as you know, Denver and actually the Highland neighborhood itself, um, there were all these little you know, independent cities that actually wasn't even considered part of Denver um, uh, in the very, very beginning. But then as the city started growing and by the early 1900s, um, you start having a lot more residential development happening and you have our sort of original, we call them original suburbs um, happening, which is a lot of the north side. And many of these neighborhoods were planned out as concurrently with our streetcar trolley lines. Um, there was an incredible network of trolleys that went throughout the city and kind of just the same principles as today when, for example, maybe there's a light rail station or there's a really great new bus line that opens up, you start to see more development along those because it just, it makes sense. You know, people can go from A to B. And so back in these early days, you know, we don't really think of like suburbs and development as happening except in modern times, but really that's sort of what was happening back then too. There was demand for housing, more people coming. There are these streetcars that started to come in. And so there were developers back then who would buy up what probably was formerly farmland and they would plat out or kind of parcel out, section out and um, say, I'm going to you know, build a bunch of these homes, just like we see some um, kind of suburbs happen today. But this specifically, this park, you can see in this very earliest map here, um, was in this neighborhood section called Downing's Edition. Um, so one of these kind of earlier uh, neighborhood sections out. And they left space here to become a park, but it was actually owned um, by a, a developer real estate investor named Augustus Heaton with a great old, old timey name. And he was a well-known um, kind of developer that, and landowner that owned some land in Denver, um, but he actually didn't even live in Denver. He, he lived elsewhere, but eventually he, he sold this land um, and uh, he sold it to the city and county. Uh, basically, it, you know, I think they were planning at this point that it was to become a park, but he sold it for, gosh, I can't even see the numbers down there. What was it? Seven, seven thousand eight hundred dollars, I think. Yes. Seven thousand eight hundred dollars was sold um, to the city of Denver for this parcel. And I can't even imagine how much money that would be now. But anyway, here's this is this is the very this deed of sale in 1906 is the earliest records we can find of this space being thought of as anything. Um, and soon after, uh, there were plans for the park drafted. So just a few 
few years later, 1912, um, you can see this space being planned out as a park. Uh, so there were plans for a pool, a shelter, uh, and a playground. And over the next few decades, these plans started to materialize. So there was a pavilion that was built. Um, there were tennis courts that were built. It was all generally more in kind of the 1930s. And that is also when we start to get to its official name. So it's interesting because up until this point, this park existed for decades and it was used and it was referred to as kind of just the, you know, the, the Navajo Park because it was on Navajo Street or people had just different local names for it, but it didn't have an official name until the 1930s when a, a council member actually, uh, who's a member of the Italian community in the area, um, led a bill to have it officially changed to be Columbus Park. Um, and that there were plans at that point for uh, some kind of Italian American heritage organizations to raise money and erect a statue. And it's really interesting because at this period of time, I mean, if you think about the 1930s and before, and in this area of Denver, it was an area of a lot of immigrants. Um, there were, it was a heavily Italian neighborhood. There were also Jewish people. There were also Mexican American, Latino, um, uh, Hispanic, population there. It was a kind of a, an, an area of immigrants and rich cultural area. Uh, and there was a large Italian population in this area. And the Italian population had also just was trying to sort of come out of uh, many, many decades of pretty extreme bias um, against Italians. Uh, uh, there's the history of not being kind and welcoming to immigrants that goes back very long in American history. Um, and there was some pretty intense anti-Italian sentiment um, that was uh, perpetuated for decades and decades. By the time we get to the 1930s, we start seeing some more um, community organizations, again, movements like this where um, Italian American community were you know, erecting statues and kind of spreading this narrative of Columbus as an integral part of American history, of founding America, discovering America, for example. Um, was a part of, of that community's, you know, struggle actually to be recognized and represented as Americans, um, which is very interesting. And there's a really interesting history um, behind, behind that as well. So just to contextualize this a little bit, um, it all lines up. At this time, there were multiple around the country movements to name parks after Columbus, to name public things after Columbus, to erect statues of Columbus. And this was, again, one of those examples of this trend of um, Italian American community uh, trying to get more recognition and acceptance and, and validity sort of in the greater American society. So 1931, the park is officially named Columbus Park. And it is known as that for the next 70, 80 something years until we officially named the, change the name. <laughs> so up, uh, Moving on from that point, uh, the park has been an incredible asset and a just community gem uh, for the neighborhood. There was a swimming pool that was dedicated. There's some great articles uh, about the use of the swimming pool that are a little a little dated, but also pretty um, pretty cute about the neighbors uh, learning how to swim there and splashing around. And it really was the center of society uh, in the neighborhood for anyone that lived around there. But it's interesting to note, um, as we start getting into the 1960s and 70s, the uh, demographics of the neighborhood started to change a bit. So as there, as I mentioned, there used to be a, a you know, very largely predominantly, um, but not exclusively, Italian-American community there. The Italian, uh, younger Italian residents started to leave the area for the northern western suburbs in the 1960s and 70s. And the area, they started to become much more um, higher demographic Hispanic um, until almost uh, was exclusively, that was the dominant um, kind of ethnic and cultural group there. And this coincides with a lot of what we, um, you know, know about sort of we call white flight or the abandoning of cities uh, and the city centers by um, more affluent and white population and leaving this area for disinvestment um, and leaving it for people um, lower income and often our um, Hispanic Black communities. But the it still remained an incredible asset to the community. And as we see, you know, culturally, 
happening in the 60s and 70s, um, the beginning of the Chicano rights movement and the beginning of um, uh, the calls for recognition, the community really taking over the space here and uh, investing in it, using it as a community center. There's these amazing photos from the 70s of some incredible 70s fashion and some incredible, I'm sure, uh, performances going on there. And just kids, you know, enjoying the pool, Little League games. Um, I'm sorry, not Little League. Uh, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember what the, the baseball team there was, but um, so it's a really wonderful community hub. But at the same time, there's increasing tension over the care of the park. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of kind of disinvestment um, in this area. And that sort of flowed into this struggle for representation, for justice, for, um, for care of these community assets and for um, pushing back against over-policing of these spaces that were being used by um, the Latinx community. And in the entire city, in the entire country, uh, there's this movement going on. This is really the Chicano rights movement. And La Raza Park was a focal point for it in Denver. Um, so you can see here a community um, member activist Anne Gutierrez speaking to the community about um, police harassment and the pool conditions that they're, you know, we would have, or you would see primarily, primarily white policemen um, over policing the park. Um, also not investing in the park, not investing in the pool, um, and a lot of community awareness and protest happening about that. So that was locally, physically about the park itself. Um, but also meanwhile, the entire, um, the entire city, there are protests going on, there's walkouts, there's the crusade for justice. Um, so there's an incredible amount of energy um, happening at this time. Um, and again, the, the park actually, was a bit of a lightning rod um, or a really a real focal point for all of this in Denver. So there are demands for a uh, cleanup of the pool. Again, this disinvestment by the city of this community asset that was so important. Um, and it, at one point we have the actual uh, rededication and kind of taking over of the park, dedicating uh, or claiming the park for the community that happened um, in 1972. And this event continued to be celebrated uh, on going on of the community taking over ownership of the, of the pool and having a uh, celebration for many, many years. However, unfortunately, um, there continued to be a pretty intense backlash um, around, the, around the park and around the use of the park. Again, the perception of the community using it in a unruly way or you know, in a way that was somehow not acceptable um, and over-policing of it probably one of the most traumatic events um, that occurred for, for people that I mean, still remember this, this wasn't that long ago, 1981, uh, was really what the police claimed were riots, um, but was this incredible, horrible, traumatic conflict um, where police uh, responded <laughs> intensely to the community members using the park. Um, and there was tear gas, dogs, um, and uh, police violence perpetrated there. Uh, there's this documentary that's actually available on YouTube with raw footage and video uh, from this and people's testimony from experiencing this. And I highly encourage checking it out. Um, it's really disturbing. So kind of conflict between users of the park and the police and the city in general continued uh, past that. There were a couple of, attempts to actually rename the park. So again, the fact that this park was named Columbus, which is an, you know really quite an insulting and not a good representation <laughs> of or the, the you know the reasons that, for example, Columbus was upheld as this discoverer of uh, the Americas um, and a lot of the actual atrocities that he did perpetrate on the native communities that he, encountered uh, kind of was, you know, insult to injury, uh, the fact that this park was named after Columbus, in addition to being uh, such a, both a joyous and wonderful spot for the Latinx community, but also the site of conflict. So there were attempts to rename it, which unfortunately did not go, um, didn't go anywhere at that time. There was also the destruction of the swimming pool, uh, which was, again, this huge community asset, and uh, the pool was filled in, uh, with concrete and was removed um, 
but we did in 1989 get the Plaza de la Raza, the kiosco erected here to again sort of recognize the importance of this space um, to the Latinx community. And finally, um, again, this was for the presentation for renaming the park, um, just an emphasis on just the incredible continued importance of this space um, with cultural celebrations, danza, solstice celebrations, together those muertos, um, motorcycle and car events, and also continued activism. Um, so I should point out that during the Chicano rights movement, La Raza Park was, was often a place to gather, to protest, um, or to start marches and start protests from that spot. Um, it was, again, an incredibly important spot in the community. So I'm going to go through these really fast because this was speaking to the main change and the reasons why the park should not be named Columbus. But I'm going to go to the end here because I love this slide. And I think now it's funny because this is part of history now. <laughs> so this is really part of the narrative of why this space is so important. Um, this is the renaming petition that Councilman Sandoval led in the summer of 2020 during the pandemic. Um, so we held a in-person signing because to get a name change for a park, you were required to present signatures. And we had to do it socially distanced, outdoors with masks on during COVID. And even with all of that, over 700 signatures were gathered. This is such an important um, thing for the community. And again, we we're not the first people to want to change the name. Um, we just completed that many, many decades of calls to, to do this and incredibly proud to be able to be a part of that. Um, this gentleman on the far right here was probably the highlight of the day. Um, He's 100 years old and he walked, physically walked over um, to the park, lives nearby and said he'd been waiting half his life for this name change and was so happy to sign the petition. Uh, and this was done, I should say, in conjunction with uh, uh, many other wonderful elected officials that supported this. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, thanks so much for listening. Uh, again, this is such a, a wonderful project to be involved with. and. Um, a lot of this research uh, was, there's, there's so much more. Um, so this is what will be going partly into our historic designation um, application. And with that, let's see. Oh, thanks so much. Um, and a row had to jump off. Um, and, oh, Gabe, do you have a question you wanna, you can unmute yourself if you want. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks Naomi and Kara and I know Ro Rowena had to jump off, but you know stuff like this is so um, applicable to our history, and that's why I, I kind of wanted to know about the books and stuff. And I appreciate Rowena saying that the resources are listed at the end of that uh, um, documentary. Um, but what I really appreciate are those black and white pictures. They're just so they tell so much of a story than the you know than the the, the pictures of today. I think. You know, because and like you said, you could see their uh, their attire and their expressions and stuff versus you know today. So it was. It's. I really appreciate you guys doing all this work. Oh, thanks so much, Gabe. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. We'll definitely keep you informed uh, as appreciate the project that. goes on. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for those um, who joined us on Facebook um, and on this call. And uh, again, this recording will be posted on Councilman Sandoval's YouTube page, and we'll also probably be sharing it um, as a link when we send out information about the name change. If people want to watch it, it's a great summary of a lot of community questions we've gotten so far about this. And um, enjoy the rest of your Fridays. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.